It's a meal. It's Emil Guillermo. Uh, Emil, I'm up to you. We're a little, we're a few minutes. See, here's the thing about going early to give you the lanyap, the something extra. Because, you know, we're regularly on 2 p.m. Pacific Live. I say that. I say 2 Pacific Live. Excuse me, I had to use my, my cough slide. It's a slide. It's not a cough button. But, you know, all right, so I usually say we do this show at 2 p.m. Pacific Live, what I call the micro talk show of the AAPI and the AAXs. And if you're, like, just passing by on, of course, on Twitter, at Emil Muck, you'll see me pop on and you'll say, oh, there he is. I mean, I can't, it's him. Or you might be on Facebook, on Facebook Live or Facebook Watch. I don't, I don't know if they require you to use your password or co to come on, but you, know, you might catch us there. You might catch us on YouTube Live. Oh, please like us or give us a finger, whatever finger they ask for on YouTube. I, I, subscribe. Do do whatever the algorithm wants because we are just like pathetic on YouTube. Not even Olympic size. So uh, we we come on and I was just rushing to do all these things. And of course, I'm going to use all my these extra times explaining to you why I I didn't start at 145 Pacific or 150 Pacific, uh, but I'm starting at about 153 or 154 Pacific. You're still getting something extra. You're still squeezing out a little bit of a meal just before here on the takeout. Uh, my takes on all things considerable. And as it turns out, there's a lot, there's a lot considerable to talk about today. And, you know, from, you know, up in the border, you know, the, the trucking thing that's had the, the, the blockade and what that could do. To uh, those people, if you're an Asian American in in Michigan, or just uh, America, see here's the thing: it it affects Asian Americans, but it'll also affect all Americans. And then from there, they're going to go down to the Super Bowl, and they're going to create gridlock. And they're already talking about, oh, Homeland Security, beware! Best place to be, just watch the game on TV. That's what that's what they want you to do. NBC, which has been talking about. Never before, a once in a lifetime, the Olympics and the Super Bowl at the same time, because who would have thought? No one had that kind of foresight. You know, I mean, it would have been nice if it was competitive and one group had the Super Bowl and another network had had the, the Winter Olympics. But no, it's like greedy, greedy NBC has it all. And... um so th this is quite a day. And then, you know, there's a new poll out. You will recall, we call this show W-D-A-A-A-T. What that? What does an Asian American think? That's what it means. What that? What, what, does, what does an Asian American think? You know, we're big on acronyms. Asian American. So W-D-A-A-A-T. And so we got to talk about this poll that came out. This poll that uh, talks about Biden, the poll that talks about where people are in terms of uh, masks, in terms of, uh, you know, just where the general political state of our country is. And, of course, they never ask Asian Americans. They, they, I mean, they, they say, well, we, we catch them somewhere. We, we cast a broad net and maybe we get an Asian American in there. But... But no one asks what an Asian American thinks. So th that's why we do this show. We do this show to let you know what an Asian American thinks about everything. And that's why we call it the micro talk show of the AAPI and the AAXs. And because you could be an Asian American mom, an AAH, or you can be an A Asian American Uyghur, not an AW, an AU. Or. If you're none of those, you can be an ALL, which is just an all's the rest of you. You're all covered. Welcome to the program. 
So, uh, as I said, there's a there's a lot happening because it is also we're in the midst of what is essentially the Super Bowl for Asian Americans. The Super Bowl for Asian Asian Americans playing football? No, not not Asian Americans playing football. Although there are, and there were, historically. In fact, there's one Asian American who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, who deserves to be in Canton, not Canton, but Canton, Canton, Ohio, the Asian American Hall of Fame. And I'm I'm talking about Roman Gabriel, the former. NFL MVP. He wasn't a bench warmer. He wasn't like a second string guy. He was an NFL MVP for the Los Angeles Rams in the 60s. Roman Gabriel, Filipino American. Look him up. He ought to be in the Hall of Fame. I'll talk about him more perhaps tomorrow because, you know, we'll talk more about the Super Bowl the closer we get to it. But the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, is turning out to be the Asian Americans Super Bowl. And have you ever seen so many Asian Americans participating at such a high level? And I'm not just talking about the Gooster. I mean, I have been talking about the Gooster for the last, that's my name for it. Because, you know, we're both from San Francisco. And, you know, she's like, she reminds me of my kids, right? She's biracial, Asian American. She reminds me, you know, you, you just, but she's the gooster. And she is probably the most interesting Asian American in the Olympics. And that's why I talked about her yesterday on show 230, what is it? Show 241. And I talked about her on show 240. But this is show 242. And I'm going to talk about the other more, not more, but just interesting Asian Americans, namely Nathan Chen and, and Chloe Kim. And just imagine if it weren't for Chloe Kim and, and, uh, and, and Nathan Chen, well, they just won two of the first three gold medals for, for the American Olympic team. I mean, we, we we give a shout out to Lindsay Jacobalis because she is in her own little minority, oldest snowboarder in the snowboard cross. Well, she's still 36. That's pretty that's pretty young. But you know, in, in snowboarding years, that's that's pretty that's pretty old. But her story, of course, is incredible. She falls in 2000. She hot dogs and falls on the way to gold and then ends up with the silver in 2006. It takes her from 2006 to 2022, 16 years, and now she's won gold. That was the first American gold medal. And it would look pretty bleak if it weren't for Asian Americans, namely Nathan Chen and Chloe Kim. And so I want to talk about them today. I want, to, I want to talk about them because let's see, I have to, I have to fix, I have to fix it. I have to fix this thing here, fix a number on a, on a key because this, this is make no mistake. This is show two forty two. Yeah. I mean, and if you think about, Eileen Gu, and you think about if she had skied, she's a free skier, not a skater, but if she had skied for the Americans, she would have been the first medal winner for America. And then you add Nathan Chen and Chloe Kim, and that would have been, that would have been three of the first four medals won by the American team at the, at the Winter Olympics. Asian American. So, uh, you know, I want to talk a little about Nathan Chen and Chloe Kim. Um, and if you've read my columns on the ALDEF blog, aaldef.org slash blog, you, you know this has been a kind of conflict. I've been conflicted about this because 
the U.S. has boycotted the games. The U.S. has boycotted the games diplomatically because of the human rights violations that are alleged against China in terms of the, the Uyghurs. And as I've mentioned, I've never said Uyghur more in a five-day, seven-day period than I have in the last seven days. And But I also have learned more specifically about the Uyghurs and the Uyghur issue, and I hope you have too, because I think this really should be seen as the Uyghur Games. These are the Uyghur Olympics. And I, I hope you, no matter what happens with medals, and, you know, we, we're going to talk about Nathan and talk about Chloe, but I hope you understand that the takeaway after all this is still the Uyghurs. We, we can't forget what happened to them or what's happening to them. As I said in my piece, first we remember the Uyghurs. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a big deal because it's almost like right under our noses this has been happening. And of course, it's been, been reported since 2017, but never has the focus been on the Uyghurs like it has since the Olympics began. And I write about it on the Aldef blog, and you should check that out. But, you know, it was always kind of a conflict. Do, do you then boycott it with the diplomats, or do you embrace, embrace the idea that, okay, these athletes, they deserve. They deserve to be honored. They deserve to be, be viewed. And I have to admit, I was kind of kind of nonchalant about Nathan Chen and Chloe Kim going into it a little bit. Maybe in the same way that they showed they were kind of I don't know if distant is the word, but over the you know, since the last Olympics, and they both have backstories, both good and bad, right? Nathan Chen uh was just having a hard time finding the spark, right? He had had a hard time finding the excitement about being really the best America, uh, the best male figure skater in the world. I mean, he's won wor the world championships three, three straight times, but he keeps, or the media keep mentioning his failure in the Pyeongchang games where he fell and, you know, didn't medal and he was supposed to. That was that was his games. He was only 18. He's 22 now. But he had something to prove. And boy, did he do it. And, and same with Chloe Kim. Chloe Kim won, became a household name in the last games. And then she got kind of like, oh, you know, just... She had a hard time finding the excitement again in the games. She had to take some time off. She she went to school, was a regular person, went to Princeton. In the same way that Nathan Chen went to Yale. But when they came back to train, they came back to train, and boy, it showed up. It, yesterday. Yesterday was the golden moment for Asian Americans. And I, I write this piece in ALDEF today. Where I say Nathan Chen, Chloe Kim, a Americans in Asia, because that's what they are. There are Americans in Asia, in a place where you think, oh, everyone looks alike, right? So homogenous. No, there are Americans in Asia. And make no mistake, there are Americans in Asia, and there are Olympic gold. So, the next question. Model minorities or just metal minorities? Because you know that's going to come up. You... Asian Americans have this sense of excellence that you know people are going to say, ah, oh. and I get into that in, in this column. But first, you know, let's just dwell a bit on the greatness of Nathan and Chloe, both Asian Americans, or as I say, Americans in Asia, and pure Olympic gold. 
And the question remains, will someone find a way to make to make it feed a new stereotype? You know, a model minority myth of Olympic sized proportions. You know, those tiger moms are hungry. They got to they got to be given something they can chew on. So we're going to get to that. But we need to celebrate America's diversity here with a massive dose of what I call really, when you think of it, legendary greatness. Because there was Chen uh, last night and he wasn't wearing, you know, when he, he was skating to Charles Osnivor the other day in the short program, he looked like he was wearing a, a t-shirted uh, tuxedo, looked really dapper, very sharp. Here he comes out in this sort of like astral red cosmos, you know, t top, a t-shirt, a jersey, you know, over uh, a black kind of mock turtle. I understand later that that's, that's a Vera Wang he was wearing. So here's Chen on ice. He, he's dazzling. He's graceful. You know, they don't call him the quad king for nothing. I mean, he does his signature four revolutions in the air. Four in one, you know, spin. But he actually does five of them in his program. <laughs> four of them for the quad king. Uh, Chen, from the, based on, or compared to the times I've seen in the past, seemed a little less technical and a lot more joyful. I'm wondering, maybe that's the music. And he was, he was skating to Elton John. You know, when, when you saw him on over the weekend at the short program, he, he actually did a short program to Charles Osnivore, which was kind of this sexy French, you know, song. And then at the end, he fist pumped and he knew he had aced it. And in fact, he did. He was like, just so far ahead of the competition just in the short program and now so last night was the free skate and boy we was at it and he was attacking and he was uh, he was a uh, graceful beautiful aggressive confident and then he ends i like the way he ends he's like he's not doing a fist pump but he's like punching his arm extends a pointed fist He's got this face, a kind of friendly scowl. It's like smiling tiger, maybe. It was just a relentless show of passion and grace. And once again, that, that confidence of a champion. And I was just, you know, I'm just looking at it, just stunned. Like, he owned it. He didn't just crush it. He owned it. He owned the whole Olympics, it seemed. So he was rewarded, of course, with a score that made him so dominant. There was no question of his excellence over the field. And he's already three-time world champion. This Olympic gold, you think, you think about it, it makes him one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. Because that quadruple, who does five quadruples in a routine? I mean... He's got to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. In a legacy event of the Winter Games, men's figure skating. I mean, honestly, at 22 and you're the GOAT? I got to see if he's uh, born in the year of the GOAT. I think he's born in May. But, you know, just let that sink in. An Asian-American man the son of immigrants from China following AAPI skating trailblazers like Michelle Kwan, Christy Yamaguchi, Tiffany Chin. And now he's at the top of the entire sport. Man, that, that's not just Asian American history. That is what they call history. That is history. And, and who knows? Who knows if he's the Tom Brady of ice skating? I'll call him the GOAT. Because I'm old enough to have seen other ice skaters, male figure skaters. I'm not, I'm not an expert in figure skating. But you tell me the technicals and you say, 
No one's ever done five of these quads in one routine. I think you got to say that sounds like goat goat material to me. But if he's if if Nathan Chen is the Tom Brady of ice skating, will fans clamor for his jersey? You know, which happens to be this print of the cosmos in red, designed by Vera Wong. You know, and and why not? Why not? Like I said, this Winter Olympics is turning out to be the Super Bowl for Asian Americans. We are dominant. We're, we're so dominant in, in these games, in these key, key events. It, it all makes you appreciate Chen's achievement, and especially I appreciate it, me, the guy at the ice rink holding on to the wall for dear life. I, I, I appreciate what he's doing. You know, going up there on the blade, you know, walking on the blades up there to the podium. And then snowboarding, I'm not much better. I mean, I look, snowboarding did happen in my in my youth. I was barely youthful. But I did try it. I fell down once and never got up. So that explains why I marvel at Chloe Kim. Man, Chloe Kim. Uh, the snow snowboarding phenom, Chloe Kim, fierce, determined on that half pipe. I know. Where's the other half? You say, well, maybe they recycled it. You know, they put it, they gave it to somewhere else. Hey, Taiwan, you want another pipe? All I know is they left the pipe that counts there and Kim owned it. Of course, she was back for gold after winning, winning in the uh, Pyeongchang uh, Olympics. She did not disappoint here's the thing about chloe chloe kim i I just love watching performers visualize their moves before they hit it you know and kim she went from it hard from the beginning Uh, she did a 1080 to start which is three full revolutions in the air i had to count that you know yeah 360 720 10 10, 8 wow three then then she calmed down and did a 900 and then she finished with another 1080 but they're all the they all have these levels of difficulty that made her virtually untouchable after just her first run and so it was a surprise to her because as she comes down she tells NBC that she had a bad practice and it put her in a bad space mentally and this is how or why you really have to appreciate these athletes and the pressure that is on them and the amount of counter, you know, the amount they have to counter, you know, to come up, you know, within themselves through their mental abilities, just to, just to offset that pressure that they feel to perform. And here's what she said. She said, I was dealing with all sorts of emotions, self-doubt. But when I was getting ready to drop into my first run, I just reminded myself that it's a brand new run and I just have to live in the now. And I was so happy I was able to do that. We're happy too. I mean, it's the meditative heart and mind of a champion. And it was a a kind of first run that left her high atop all her other competitors with a little cushion. She had two more runs. So you had a question, would she coast to the gold? Not Kim. She tried a, what they call a cat 12. I don't know why cat 12, but it's a 1260 move that she said she had done just once before. 1260. That's you know, 1080 plus almost another, another one, 1260 move. I guess it all depends on how high up you are, how many times you can spin. But she went for it both times and she fell. Still, she left with gold because no one could touch her. And she gets that historic back-to-back snowboarding win. And like I said, it wasn't all that certain it would happen. Because she struggled after the last Olympics. Struggled to get back the feeling. She took time off, went to Princeton. 
still had the support of her family. She also fell in love. And when she came back to her snowboard, she had to find that spark again. Even champions have to overcome, right? And this time around, it was a Chloe renewed. This is what she said. She said, quote, I'm in a much better headspace. And I think I have a better idea of what to expect when she was asked about it. Well, how are you going to deal about being a household name now? I mean, you see Chloe Kim in a lot of commercials now. She says, I'm just so eager to see my loved ones, my family, my dog, my boyfriend. So I think uh, that'll keep me happy. And I'm just going to feel all the feelings and be proud of myself. A little loving self-compassion goes a long way always works and apparently it helped chloe kim she, she deserves to be proud of herself she deserves to feel that that self-love it's such a hard thing you know you, you go up there and try to do something that no one else can do you fail and you can start getting down on yourself the psychological aspects of fighting the mountain, or in this case, the half pipe, gravity, air, fans, haters, all that. But that loving self-compassion helped make, along with her skill, helped make Chloe Kim her own American history. The daughter of Korean immigrants, now back-to-back Olympic gold. And, you know, isn't it interesting? One of the first people to greet her after that first run, they showed it on TV. There was Eileen Gu who gave Kim a hug. And, you know, I've dubbed Eileen Gu. Uh, affectionately, I call the the gooster, but I've dubbed her an ABC, but with a T, you know, so American born Chinese team. Just think she could have won the first gold medal for the U S earlier this week. And then three of the first four gold medals would have been Americans. But Gu, a freestyle skier, was playing for her mother's homeland, China. You'll have to see my previous column for that. But And I will have more to say about Gu later. I've said some at show 241 yesterday and show 240. Look, as a fellow San Franciscan who grew up here and... And I know she's immensely talented. I admire her. Except we want to know why she isn't skiing for the American team. I mean, that that is the issue that makes her the most interesting Asian American. Because she doesn't exactly answer that question directly. Once again, read my previous column on the ALDEF blog, aaldef.org slash blog. But now Chen, you know, especially when you think about these games, Nathan Chen is, he's atop the Asian American ice skating boom. And the cream is rising and overflowing and it's atop all of ice skating. You know, you've got the Winter Olympics were four of the six Figure skaters on the U.S. team alone are Asian American. Karen Chen, Alyssa Liu, Vincent Zhou, who had to drop out because of COVID, and Nathan Chen. And then you add ice dancer Madison Chalk. The U.S. team alone is chock full of APIs. And so it just made me wonder, are, are are we possibly going to see an addendum to the negative, positive stereotype, the model minority myth, Olympic style, you know, crouching tiger, hidden sow cows? I hope not. But as I was thinking that, here was NBC Olympic anchor Mike Tirico. After Chen's victory, he's on prime time. He's saying, quote, we've just seen in the last 24 hours, Eileen Gu, who's going to Stanford, Right, And we saw Chloe Kim and we talked about her time in Princeton and Nathan Chen going to Yale 
in addition to being best in the world, gold athletes, also very intelligent, but also in some ways, I think it has helped round them out as individuals. He was talking about being smart and going to school, I guess. He goes on, he says, and it wasn't about being obsessive all the time about getting back to a chance to compete for a gold medal. I'm not so sure. Maybe not for them, but maybe certainly for for uh, Nathan Chen's mom. Nathan was being interviewed, asked about, well, you haven't talked to your mother yet. Oh, I talked to her. And he said, well, how, well, how did that go? And he said, well, it was pretty much business. She told me about things I should have done. Typical, typical tiger mom, right? But he loves her. And, you know, like I said, he grew up in Salt Lake. They moved to California, to Orange County, to Irvine, to train with his current Olympic coach. And he would drive her in, he said, the trusty Prius. These people have made sacrifices for the golden boy. They've made sacrifice. And Nathan, he was asked a question. What do you say to some budding young person who, you know, what's a, what, what's the reason for success? And he, he said he owed it to his parents. He said the best recommendation he can make for a young skater. Listen to your parents. That is so Asian American, right? So anyway, uh, Tariko, when he was going through this, oh, this this one goes to Yale, this one goes to Stanford, this one goes to Princeton, he could have mentioned Nathan and Eileen are classical pianists and Eileen's 1580 SAT, not as good as her 1620 in the big air, free ski, Nathan being pre-med, you know, but he knew he was sort of going in that way. And I just hope we can just sort of like Stop it before it develops into a full-fledged chapter of model minorityness. They're not model minorities, right? They're metal minorities. And we can appreciate their hard work, their unique world-class talents. And let's hope that goodwill spills over and helps everyone else see them as a real part of all the rest of us, non-Olympic Asian Americans. Because this should be a moment where we're beyond any stereotypes, right? Like I said, not model minorities, not metal minorities. We don't need a medal to be seen and heard as human and present and real. But it is human to say, hey, Nathan. Chloe, fellow Asian Americans, and to have a certain sense of pride in that fact. Got to have a swish. Got to have a swish. So I, I've been thinking about that, and, um, I, you know, these games have been exciting. Uh watching their individual exploits and I, I i really think i really think that we go back to the tapes and watch nathan skate watch chloe kim's that that golden run the first run where she got a 94 i think they're historical it will be historical. Well, historical for Chloe Kim back to back, but Nathan, he did it in the all. You know, that's the legacy event. Men's figure skating. So it's exciting, exciting, exciting times for Asian Americans, and of course, like I said, as we enjoy these individual achievements, let's not forget the Uyghurs. I mean, give them the first gold medal. Give them, honor them, and try to figure out what, what can be done. China denies that anything's happening with the Uyghurs, but 
the Uyghur Congress, there's a, the Uyghur diaspora. They, they have uh, their, their president said, said every Uyghur sportsman, every Uyghur citizen in, in China is hostage. We got to take them seriously. We know better. So we talked about Nathan, we talked about Chloe, we talked about Goo, we talked about the Uyghurs. This other thing that should concern us is Omicron, the mass, everything's political, but everything's political because people have just kind of, they've given up. They're saying we are tired about the we're, we're tired about the virus. And let me just pull out this poll. This poll is kind of interesting. It's a CNN poll. And like I said, WDAAT, what does an Asian American think? They, they never get enough Asians to include us. But I have to say, every Asian American I've talked to, and I've talked to a number, I haven't talked to enough to be scientifically uh you know within a margin of error plus or minus 200 <laughs> but it's just that and maybe it's just i'm talking to people who are, are like me they think about where we are and they know that every area is going to be different the northeast is you know they experience things first so they're going through a kind of dip and yeah Kathy Ockel can say, yeah, mass mandates, we're lifting them. And all these blue states are lifting the mass mandates because it's all being driven by politics. It's not being driven by the science anymore. And and partially because you look at these these polls and the polls are, are saying, what are your feelings about COVID-19 pandemic? This is CNN's poll. They just released it today. 75% are burned out. 60% are angry, 58% are worried, 49% are confused, 47% are optimistic. You know, I'm, I'm none of those. That, that's why I say, what does an Asian American think? The, the Asian Americans I talk to are none of those. I mean, they, they're concerned. They're, they're curious. They're, they want to know when it's going to be over. But they're none of those. And, and that's a significant thing. Because when politicians see these polls, they say, country's burned out. Better start getting rid of these masks. Better start lifting these mandates. Better start doing these things or, you know, we're going to be out of a job. And it shouldn't be based on their polling numbers for their political futures, it should be based on, on the science of what's happening with this, this virus and how can we make sure that we can end it once and for all. I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that. I mean, not taken as a whole, the, the whole country. The numbers that are happening in New England and, you know, some other places in, uh, in in the country very different from what's happening out west, what's happening uh, in the Midwest. I mean, un unfortunately, it's zip code by zip code. But people say, "Well, they're doing it. Why can't we? We're free too." Anyway, the numbers are are really just uh, driving this. And of course, the Republicans are out there to get Fauci because they blame, they want to blame, you know, everything on Fauci. It's not his fault. But even Fauci is saying something like, well, we, we may have turned a corner. So let's hope, let's hope we, we've turned a corner and we're not going to see a, a spike that we'll regret. Because, you know, once we go out in the summertime and new variants, BA2, you know, it happens. We don't really know what's going on. Some virologists that I see have reported 
saying that, okay, if we wait a couple of weeks, we'll know what BA2 might do. And so maybe we can go out and gradually and get back to normal and not have the kind of spike after the summer. And we had the same thing last year, right? We went out. Oh, we're opening up June, July, opening up. In California, the, the, the legislature is voting on whether or not to end the state of emergency, which is they're not ending the state of emergency. Uh, well, they're doing it for political reasons. It's being raised by a Republican who's saying, we're having the Super Bowl. I don't see any emergency, which is a simplistic approach to what's really going on. But that's where we are with the rhetoric these days. Politics is driving response to Omicron. What's really troublesome about this CNN poll is they ask people, what has Biden done that you approve of? This is a, this is a real killer uh, question. What has Joe Biden done that you approve of? 56% said nothing, disapprove of all. 56% of respondents. 15% said, what has he done that we approve of? 15% said the economy. Just 15%. That means 85% said something else. 6% said coronavirus. 4% said personal traits. Oh, what a good guy, right? 4% said foreign policy. Oh, that means Ukraine. 2% said other issues. And this is where Asian Americans are, I would think. Because you look at what Biden has done. There's a lot that he's done for Asian Americans. First African American, Asian American to be Vice President of the United States. That's for starters. Within the first week, all those executive orders, acknowledging Asian Americans, acknowledging what's happening to Asian Americans since the pandemic. Since the pandemic to this day, more than 10,000 instances of hate. Incidentally, that's the other reason why what happened to Chloe Chen, or Chloe Chen, I just, I just conglomerated them. What happened to Nathan Chen and Chloe Chloe Kim is important because all of this, all of this, uh, their, their, their gold rush is happening in a time when there have been 10,000 instances of Asian American hate since the pandemic began. And I, I think, I hope that is, is an outcome, a positive outcome of this what I call the Asian American Super Bowl, the Winter Olympics, where, where Nathan Chen is so dominant, so dominant. And Nathan and Chloe together. And, you know, we'll bring in uh, Eileen Gu. She's, she's skiing for the, for the Soviet Union. Oh, no, she's skiing for Russia. She's skiing for China. Apologies there. There is no more Soviet Union. It's ROC. I had rocks in my head. But in terms of American-born Asians, you can't help but notice. Just can't help but notice this, this massive trend. And maybe that, that will lead to a real change that we see in attitudes toward Asian Americans. So, you know, Biden, you think that, you know, like, the question was, what has Biden done that you approve of? And only 2% said other issues. I would have to put us, Asian Americans, in that 2% because you look at what, what he's done for Asian Americans. Significant? I mean, it's not insignificant, and it's certainly a lot more. He answered the call of things that were happening to our community. I just think it's really sad when Joe Biden, a third question they ask is, do you approve of Biden's job performance? Only 41% approved. It's sinking. 
and 58% disapprove. This is a sad, a sad thing for, for him because it also coincides with the inflation numbers and the inflation numbers were far worse than they predicted in, in January. Inflation's at around 7.5%. And you got to go pretty far back in the 80s to recall when it was that high. And if it stays that high, what's really bad is that if people are getting, well, the stock market is usually giving back a little bit more if you are in the stock market. But if inflation's at 7 seven percent and you're only getting a three percent raise if that or a two percent raise you're losing money so this brings up the idea that uh, an old political adage it's the, it's the economy stupid right and it just seems that that will play a part in the midterms and it could play a part by time um, the next general rolls around and we got to start seeing some life from Joe Biden or I don't know how long uh, before people start considering well what what do the Democrats have in the future is it Kamala Harris, an Asian American, the vice president? Would she be the standard bearer for Democrats or would there be some other people jumping in the fray? So, I mean, a lot of things coming out today. And of course they didn't ask what, what does an Asian American think? But I would say that for the most part, Asian Americans like myself, are they wish that biden would do more or could do more in terms of economy the economy and jobs and that kind of thing but but basically he has delivered for asian americans but he could do more i'm just not seeing uh, he could run out of time. He's got a, a State of the Union address coming up. And he's going to have to score. Because the Democrats can use a little momentum. So, I... Um, tomorrow I'll talk about Roman Gabriel. If you don't know who Roman Gabriel is, I'll explain who he is tomorrow. But we're heading into that big... It's not a holiday, but it's my, some people think it's a holiday, but now I understand it's going to be, it could be a mess down in Los Angeles because of the, the blockade, the trucker blockade is moving from the Midwest and they're all heading to, to Los Angeles. So things are going to be changing between now and Sunday. And by Sunday, it could be a totally different story about what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, we have Ukraine. And from the stories I'm reading, it sounds like Putin is playing the long game and he's willing to wait out. Everyone wants a diplomatic issue or a, a diplomatic solution. But it's unclear where that is right now. It's just slowly simmering there, the Ukraine issue as Russia has its people in place and the Americans are with its NATO forces, it could be a long stalemate. And so what is an American to do? I guess we got the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday. We've got more Olympics. Nathan Chen has, I think he's got another, I think he's got another uh, event. I don't think Chloe Kim does, but Eileen Gu does, and we'll be watching her, and I'll have uh, some things to say about her more. And it's not that I, like I said, I, I like her. I just am 
as everyone else is, curious about what her deal is with China. Does it matter? Well, in a way, it matters how we, we look at her. I mean, maybe she represents this person who is the new kind of global citizen, able to go free anywhere she wants. But, you know, if it were you and me, we wouldn't be as free. I mean, I don't win gold medals. Not like she does. She only has one. But I guess as long as she will know, as long as she keeps winning, she's good. We'll talk more about her as the games go on. Hey, uh, that's it for us uh, today. We'll be back tomorrow. This is show 242. I appreciate you being here with us. We're here Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific. You can catch us uh, on on Twitter. Maybe you're watching on Twitter on the Periscope graphic user interface. It's not really Periscope. It's kind of like a they rebranded it as Twitter. But uh, Twitter at Emil Amok, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. You can watch replays of this on amok.com. You can wa- always watch us live on Facebook, on Facebook Watch Live, I think it's called, or Facebook Live. I don't know if they ask you to sign in, if you know, if they ask you if you're a member or whatever. Um, or you can go to my my Facebook page at emilgalermo.media or at at just my name, Emil Guillermo. I usually put put up the live thing there. Follow us, friend us, do all the things and give us whatever fingers they ask for. I think they ask for thumbs. They want thumbs. And if you can spare one, please. Uh, yeah, 242. That's this show. We talked about goo on 241 and on 240. More tomorrow on 243. So I, I'm just, you know, kind of, it's funny watching, watching Chloe Kim and Nathan Chen perform because they, what they do is so extraordinary that it's not even, you can't even detect, you know, by, you got to slow things down. You got to capture it on video or on film. And then you have to slow down to appreciate, oh my God, they actually did that. I mean, it looks like something when you're watching it, but it's just a marvel. And, and that's why they're, they're in the, they're Nathan Chance goat. It's gotta be greatest of all time. I mean, he just is. And it's not the technology. It, I don't think the skates are better. Well, maybe they are, but I bet you he could probably do the same things. I better watch what I'm saying because, you know, some skaters would say, no, he can't. But he's a gifted, gifted athlete at 22. And that's the thing. There are other gifted young people coming up, pushing them out, and they will be reflective of their times and surpass these other athletes. It's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, you look at how the games have progressed when the X games were just really the fringe, or these are these fringe hot doggers are like all over the mountain. And now they're some of the most interesting uh, athletes because of the stunts they perform. I mean, it really, it's, I think it's amazing to see how they, you know, they, they do what they do. And I'm talking about goo. I'm talking about, uh, Chloe Kim can't really appreciate unless you like capture it on film, slow it down and say, wow, she, she did that. It happened so fast. And Nathan Chen for his five minutes in the free skate, Chloe Kim for her, Minute and a half on the half pipe, immortalized. Part of our Asian American history. Your kids, if they have kids, they'll say, God, the Olympian, Chloe Kim, the Olympian, Nathan Chan, when they dominated, 
when they dominated during a time when Asian Americans were attacked. 10,000 instances of hate, according to the Stop AAPI Hate. And there they were, champions. And people looked at them, and they didn't see a virus. They didn't see a spy. They didn't see scapegoat. They didn't see, they saw world-class excellence. It happened. And I hope people, like I said, I hope the spillover is such that they don't just see Nathan and Chloe. They see see them as part of us and that we get the benefit because people say, oh, yeah, Asian Americans. Yeah, they matter. They count. They're real. They're human. And they have these exceptional folks who are talented through hard work and also through just their perseverance, right? Their, their mental perseverance. They're, they're, you know, when you hear both Nathan and Chloe talk about, you know, my mind wasn't right. I had to get my mind right. You understand how it's all a psychological game that we can defeat, that we can overcome. And I'm talking about everything, not just the Olympics, but everything that comes down that we can't figure out. Sometimes it's just a psychological game. And Chloe, Chloe Kim said, yeah, I just had to think, oh, here's another run. I'm in the now. And I'm in the present. It was it was a meditative statement. And afterwards she said, Hey, I, I just I got I have to be proud of myself. I have to not not take the trolls, not take people who say, Oh, look at she's not any good. Just not you just discard that. A little self-love, a little loving self-compassion always helps when you are in the fishbowl of the Olympics, right? And it's coming at you from the world, from all sides. So hats off to Chloe Kim, Nathan Chen. And once again, thank you for listening to this show. Back again tomorrow with show 243. A meal mugs take out. Hey, uh, thank you again. As you know, regular listeners of this show know that by the time I get to this point, you know, I'm just, I'm just in the contemplative mood. And I say, hey, look, take it from Nathan. Take it from Joe. A little bit of self-love. Yeah, put your arm here. Give yourself a little. You're deserving. You're worth it. You're enough. Oh, how many times did we hear Suni Lee say that in the summer? She would say, I'm enough. I'm enough. Something to think about. If you find yourself under duress, under pressure, sometimes thinking, oh. I mean, Chloe said to herself, her mind was full of self-doubt. It happens. You got to quiet that inner critic. You got to... Scrunch it out of you with an inner hug. So, as I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Emil Guillermo here. Till tomorrow. Mahal. Uh-huh.